standing at six foot tall with this slender frame and this lovely dress and probably the last person that you'd place as the farmer, right? That's the power of the woman. I am in fact a farmer and a pharmacist. And being from a science background, statistics are always going to be attractive to me. And I'd like to share some with you. Nigeria's current population of 200 million is expected to double in the next 30 years. The youth population has tripled in the past 40 and is currently the largest on the continent. And it's expected to increase where every one out of three African youths will be Nigerian. It also has the highest unemployment rates for youth and women at 30 and 27% respectively. Hold that thought. To better explain why I've shared these statistics with you, I'm gonna take you to the start of my journey. Now in case you can already tell by my accent, I was in fact born and bred in the UK. And growing up with a strong name like Chibugo or Kafo was not the easiest at the time. And especially because being Nigerian was plagued with so many negative connotations. And I decided that I would tell people that my name was Ashley Okafor instead, named after a favorite character from a TV show. This would be the first time I was having an identity crisis. Now, unfortunately for me, Ashley or Ashley in my native language translates to someone who lies or gossips. And so once my parents found out about this, things didn't end so well for me because my parents were proud Nigerians. I mean, instead of giving their children Western names, they gave us names like Chibugu and Sopolo Chuku. I mean, <laughs> very serious about the Nigerian thing. And they caught on to my identity crisis and wanted to nip it in the bud early, and rightly so. And so one day, my mother called me into her room and said, Chibugu, you're going to school in Nigeria because you're the Ada. Now in the Igbo culture, there is a great sense of importance that's placed on the Ada, or the first daughter, who tends to be the leader of the pack. And their thought was that if they got it right with me, then the rest would follow suit. And so, true to my mother's word, one day I was pulled out of a Catholic school in the UK and placed into a community school in the rural parts of Ota, Ogun State, where I traded 24 hours power supply to little to none, and washing machines to having to wash my clothes with buckets and water. Was it difficult? Yes. <laughs> Was it a culture shock? Massively. But these would be the best years of my life. I had so much fun. But sadly, the ajebota in me was just a little bit too strong. And I was ill all the time. If I didn't have typhoid, I had malaria. It got so bad that my immune system dropped so low that my kidneys started to fail. And so I was taken out of the Nigerian school and reintroduced into the British system. But this time, things were different, right? I had a greater understanding of, what, who, of who I was and a better sense of pride of being Nigerian but at least so I thought. Fast forward a few years, and I graduated from King's College London, after which I had the bright idea to move back to Nigeria, to the surprise of my friends and family. You see, I had always wanted to work within the NGO sector, and what better place to do it? So the idea was to start off with a few six weeks internship. Those six weeks turned into the current three years and counting because I was exposed to a side of Nigeria that I wasn't familiar with. Now, yes, I went to school in Nigeria, but visits to and with my family looked like moving bef between the more developed parts of the nation. But this job at this NGO, it required me to operate in the more impoverished and poorer parts of the nation. And my experiences and interactions on the field would be the second time I was having an identity crisis. Was this what it meant to be Nigerian? 13.2 million out-of-school children. 145 women of childbearing age dying daily. 25% of young girls and 10% of young boys reporting some sort of sexual violence before the age of 18. This couldn't be the Nigeria that I knew and loved. I was distraught, and I left the NGO sector, I suppose, in search for answers or some sort of understanding. 
Now I knew why everyone thought I was crazy to relocate back to Nigeria. But there was one day that proved that I wasn't. You see, I had gone to a village with a friend of mine and we stumbled across an elderly lady who was harvesting pure honey. Now, by all means, call me ignorant, but I didn't know we had pure honey and of that taste and quality in Nigeria. Because if we did, why wasn't it being represented on any of the supermarket shelves? And I remember taking a step back in that moment. And my feet sunk into the arable soil and there was shade being provided by these massive coconut and palm trees and it all started flooding back. Nigeria was blessed, inundated in natural resources. Now I might appreciate it could be difficult for you to understand but in that moment my hope was restored in our nation. I became obsessed. I started researching about honey production in Africa, its many uh, health benefits, the mechanisms of the hives, the, bee, the bees' uh, behavioral properties. It all fascinated me. Now, along the journey, people have always asked me the same thing. Why honey? Why not any of the other agricultural products? And my response is always the same. Why not? But people are not satisfied with this answer, so I've come up with three theories as to why I moved into this space. The first, maybe I'm secretly a thrill seeker. This is and has been such an adventurous journey. Going into bushes and in search for land, making homes for wild, defensive African bees, and in the process, stumbling on the odd snake or two. Sounds like fun, right? <laughs> Secondly, maybe because I'm a scientist and I naturally align to the many health benefits of honey, from its high antimicrobial activity to the numerous act antioxidants that are found in honey. Did you know that if bees were to go extinct in this very moment, that we as humanity would only have four years left to survive? Because they pollinate all of our food. And the third, which is my favorite, like every woman in here, Maybe the queen in me resonates with the queen bee and her worker bees. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> what I do know is that I wasn't alone in my love for original honey. No, every time I would buy up as many kegs as possible, just between my friends and my family, it would almost always leave my hands. And I think there was just this aha moment, or maybe the Igbo in me was awakened, and I decided I've got a business on my hands, so I'm gonna turn it into one. So it'd be simple, that was the idea. Buy up large volumes of honey, process, package, and sell. Easy, right? Wrong. Very, very wrong. As I moved from the north to the south of Nigeria in the search for large volumes of honey, it was almost always adulterated. If it wasn't filled with water, it was filled with corn syrup and even sugar. And so the plan had to change. If I was going to be serious about this, I would have to set up my own apiary, which is another word for a bee farm, and harvest the honey myself. Now, moving back to Nigeria on my own was a task in itself, but setting up a farm, whole nother world. And my mother was my first introduction into what African excellence entailed. And so I take advice from her extremely seriously. And when I asked her what to do, she said, and I quote, if you know you're going to do it at all, hmm? <laughs> give it your all. And so I did. And this young British-born Nigerian who hails from the East and went to school in the West set up a farm in the North. I started by acquiring land, which by doing so makes me amongst the less than 20% of women who have access and ownership to land for agricultural use in the world. I also bought 25 locally manufactured hives, which I think are better suited to the temperament of African bees. And in our first year, we harvested a disappointing five liters. And in the following year, we would lose half of the farm to a fire outbreak. But you see, this is the beauty of time, dedication, and genuinely never giving up. Today, we boast over 250 hives. And our honey, in its uniqueness in taste and quality, has seen its di distribution across the world. Now, 
It is true that life is full of surprises. I mean, I never anticipated that I'd find myself in this space. But what I have come to learn so far is that you need to take a step back and analyze your life and connect the dots so that you can understand better where it is that you're going and plan for it. And I'll give you an example of this. So business was great, right? But I felt like it, it lacked something. I felt like I wasn't completely fulfilled. And there was an occasion that stirred this. I had gone into an office to discuss the expansion of the farm. And the gentleman that sat across the table to me said that I was too young to be taken seriously in this sector. And that if he was to give me some advice, it'd be that I'd need to add some weight so that I fill out a bit more and get married. And it'd be then that people will know that I was ready for business. And I wondered what my age, my body size, and my marital status had to do with me running a company. And you know what's so disappointing about this experience? It's not that it happened to me, no. It's that there are so many other young women that can relate to this story in one way or another. Now, growing up, I have to admit that I was completely oblivious and ignorant to the many issues that women faced. But I wasn't completely to blame for this. I mean, I grew up in a home where both of my parents worked and were financially independent of each other. My mother is a living example of what the powerhouse that is a woman. And my father never expected anything outside of a standard of excellence in all that I did, irrespective of my gender. But it's only now that I realize how fortunate I was to grow up in an environment that fostered for my empowerment as a young woman instead of my oppression. Now, globally, I know that we are in a paradigm shift where the world has finally awakened to the many issues that women are facing. But I still think that Nigeria and Africa at large is yet to tap into the beauty of empowering the voices of women to be heard and to be heard on the right platforms. And you see, advocating for me, for women, is it comes from a place of self-awareness in that I don't go about my day-to-day -day operations from the place of being a woman. I do what I do because I'm a human first. And so the thought of limiting the dreams and aspirations, the purpose, and the voices of women like me based on their gender, which is something that they neither chose nor can control, is something that doesn't sit well with me and shouldn't sit well with anybody. And as a young black female business owner, I fall into three minority groups, which means that I can relate and understand to the barriers that exist to the development of youth and women, full stop, youth and women within the African context, and youth and women within the business sector, specifically the agribusiness sector. And I believe this is where our company moved out of being a business and more of a social enterprise where we create job opportunities for women and youth, ensuring that they are sustainable income generators in their respective homes and thereby enforcing food security. If you had a fruit or vegetable today, there's a 70% chance that it was produced by a female farmer. There are more female rural farmers than there are male, but they operate on a smaller scale and produce lower yield. And it has been proven that this is largely attributed to their poor access to agricultural inputs or resources, which look like fertilizers and credit. And statistics have also stated that given equal access to resources to men, that there'll be an increase in the national productivity of developing countries by 2.5 to 4%, and thereby lifting 100 to 150 million people out of chronic hunger. And so alongside Associated Initiative, our business has empowered 2,000 women and youth through technical capacity training sessions, provision of agricultural inputs like hives and tools, access to finance by startup seeds, and access to markets by off-taking their harvested products at economically fair prices. Now, I'm sure we've all heard the quote that says, be the change that you want to see, or the change in the world that we want starts with you and me. And a lot of people think that this is so cliche, but honestly, I just couldn't agree more with it. I personally believe that it's important for us as individual and citizens to understand that we can change the world around us and improve lives while chasing your dreams and achieving your goals, and that you don't need to be a politician or own a massive NGO to make that happen. 
I also believe that the agriculture is key to unlocking Nigeria's economic potential. And I look forward to the time that the mindset moves from it being local and rural and less of, and more of a viable option to overturning our economic conditions. And you know, if we're not voicing success stories within the agricultural sector at the local level, thereby encouraging our already dynamic and intelligent youth to study agriculture and maybe apply modern techniques to the agricultural value chain, then Nigeria will continue to export cocoa beans, for example, and import chocolate. Now, at the start of this, I told you that the youth population in Nigeria is the highest on the continent of Africa and is expected to increase to the space where there's going to be one out of every three African youths will be Nigerian. So that means that every decision that we make as Nigerian youths not only affects us, but the continent as a whole. Now, that's a lot of responsibility. So this is my story and my part in the grander picture. My question is, what's yours? Thank you.